Hello and thank you for joining this Onc Live TV Peer Exchange. This program will feature expert panel discussions focused on the treatment of multiple myeloma. My name is Keith Stewart. I'm a professor at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona and the Dean for Research. Joining me today are Dr. Jim Berenson, the Medical and Scientific Director of the Institute for Myeloma and Bone Cancer Research in Los Angeles. Dr. Sundar Jagannath, Director of the Multiple Myeloma Research Program and Professor at the Tisch Cancer Institute at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. Dr. Shaji Kumar, a Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Sagar Lonil, Professor and Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs for the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology at the Winship Cancer Institute, Emory University School of Medicine. And Dr. Jeffrey Zonder, Associate Professor of Medicine at Wayne State University School of Medicine in the Department of Oncology at the Barbara Ann Kermanis Cancer Institute. Thank you to all of you for joining us today and uh, let's get started. Today we're going to start with the uh, current treatment of multiple myeloma and I'd like to start off uh, by talking about some changes and some clinical trials we've seen recently in smoldering myeloma. And maybe I'll start with you Dr. Lonio. And would you like to uh, tell us a little bit, just for background for the audience, about the important clinical trial that the Spanish group did that, in smoldering myeloma, which has perhaps changed how we think about that uh, condition? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good point. And actually, at the ASH 2014 meeting, we actually saw an update of that trial. So the Spanish group published a little over a year ago a randomized trial of Lendex versus observation for high-risk smoldering using the Spanish definition. And what they showed was an improvement in progression-free survival and overall survival. And one of the challenges of that is it was a very small study. And so understanding how to use that to translate to clinical practice changes has remained unclear. They presented an updated ASH 2014 where the survival benefit continues to hold up with longer follow-up. Again, raising the question of should we begin to think about treating some of these high-risk patients? That, that trial was limited in its applicability because it unfortunately involved patients that on the untreated arm waited until they met CRAB criteria to be treated. And also on the treatment arm with biochemical progression, these patients were allowed to receive therapy. So it was kind of an unfair comparison really in terms of showing the outcomes. Right, and, and, and this is lenalidomide and dexamethasone we're talking about as, as treatment. Correct. So maybe just to, uh, to see how people react to that. Dr. Dr. Zander, what, what was your reaction to that trial when you heard about it and how, how has it influenced your practice uh, today? It hasn't really affected my, uh, uh, my treatment patterns very much at all. Uh, the, uh, the, the patients who were not treated with lenalidomide and dexamethasone uh, did uh, worse than we would expect them to do. Um, and it probably has to do with what Jim said, that there was a, uh, a delay beyond the time that in practice we would probably uh, consider treating these patients. Um, so uh, until I see a study where uh, maintenance, uh, well, early initiation of therapy uh, beats a group of patients who do how I would expect them to do in that setting, I don't think it's going to change my practice. So it would be fair to say, I think I'm hearing from everybody on the, on the panel, that this trial, although it was provocative, hasn't resulted in anybody using active therapy for smoldering myeloma today. Is that correct, uh, Sundar? But, well, I look at it that this was an important study, first of all. Um, it really put everybody on notice about uh, when so much progress has been made and the treatment has become much more tolerated by the patient, do we really have to wait on especially high-risk myeloma patient till they become symptomatic? That means they develop a bone disease, they develop CRAB criteria, renal impairment. Of course, anemia was not bad, but renal impairment or bone disease. So it put us on notice. It also I'm said the up. practice. Yeah. Go ahead. It, it also you know, looked at us in the United States we have a tendency, especially in those we consider high risk or we had suspicion, we often do MRI of the entire spine and pelvis because this was published long time ago that MRI is much more sensitive and is able to pick up focal bone disease. Demopolis has published a while back. So it is almost, was practice changing. We do quite often MRI of the entire spine and pelvis 
so in addition you, to just skeletal so, survey. Uh, let, let me just ask Dr. Berenson, do you recommend that in smoldering myeloma? Do you do PET scans and MRI scans? Well, we only do it if there are areas that are symptomatic, and obviously we do that in patients with solitary plasma cytoma, and I've certainly picked up multiple so myelomas. So you have a patient who has 20% uh, plasma cells but no crap, uh, no hypercalcemia, no renal failure, no anemia, you don't do any imaging then? Well, we certainly do skeletal surveys, and I would also tell you that in your smolders, you should be doing bone densitometry if it's negative. A lot of these people are osteoporotic and deserve That's bisphosphonate. That's a very good point. That, that, but, but certainly, personally, yeah. I, I, I quite commonly using PET scans to evaluate these patients. And, and they, but yeah. what, Jeff? Yeah, what, absolutely. Yeah. You know, when, when you have a patient whose bone marrow is more uh, heavily infiltrated with plasma cells than you might have expected, or whose M protein is quite high, yet they're clinically asymptomatic. Uh, before, before not treating a patient like that, I go to I, I do that extra more sensitive imaging, and I use both of those modalities um, to make sure that I that my patient is actually smoldering and not, not a, a symptomatic patient whose uh, disease just isn't detected with less sensitive imaging. The problem with that is we don't have outcome data to show that actually does anything. So although it's nice to do, it's expensive. And until we show that a group of patients that were smolders, got pets, had different outcome, we're adding a lot of cost to the healthcare budget. I want to move on to, uh, so it was one of the things it seems to me that happened after this trial was that there was some consideration of whether all the patients we think are smoldering should really be called smoldering or whether we should be in some of these high-risk patients intervening with treatment. Right. So there was recently an International Myeloma Working Group publication speaking to this. Do you want to describe that for us, Dr. Loniel? Yeah, so I mean I think it actually makes some of the discussion a little bit um, uh, dated, if you will, and that is uh, there is a recent paper from the workshop or from the working group that has redefined what it means to be symptomatic myeloma. And while those CRAB criteria remain, added to it are three new criteria. The presence of greater than one focal bone lesion by MRI or PET scan is one of those. Uh, free light chain ratio greater than 100 is a second. The third is greater than 60% plasma cells in the bone marrow. And the reason those were added is not an arbitrary this is the cutoff, but there actually are, there is data now that says those patients have a greater than 80% risk of progressing to myeloma within two years. There's no reason to wait. So, so, uh, so just to sort of summarize that, there, there's, most people are saying nobody would treat smoldering myeloma unless they're high risk. On a these, trial. These are the three reasons that we think people might be high risk that need active treatment. Loss of plasmocytosis, high serum free light chain ratio, MRI, PET scan positivity. I think I, Jim made I, a very good point about doing bone density scan too. And would you treat these patients with bisphosphonate? Absolutely. I would also chime in that although I too would treat the high risk patients, be careful. We have no data that shows that in the long run we're doing any good. But I would agree with you, and I did agree at the recent debate I had on this, that those patients ought to get pretty quick therapy. So, so I guess uh, it's, it's maybe semantics, but um, I'm not saying I would treat the high risk. I would treat who we now define myeloma. Yeah, but, but that was what? formerly called high risk. We just changed our definition. What, what about a patient who a month ago was high risk and, or, or smoldering and who now meets the new criteria? Are you changing your therapy for these? Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not either. All right, let me, let me move this.